Today's video is going to be about Otis, an elevator company, a very famous case in technology management, and an example of a company that used technology to compete. And um, the case is from the 1970s, but as I will show, it is very, very relevant um, today. So let's get started. Otis is a company that provides elevators. It's probably a company that you have seen um, and uh, know about, just as you probably know about the other elevators companies out there. So how did Otis get started? Well, this guy, Alicia Otis. He was an engineer and uh, he, was, uh, he, he noticed that people didn't want to use elevators because they were unsafe. So he invented something called the safety elevator around 1840. Um, and um, this is from an exhibition um, where he showed um, the features of the safety elevators, elevator. And um, um, as you can see, um, he's standing on a platform bowing to the audience and he's bowing because he's just shown a trick. And the trick is that somebody used a knife to cut the rope of the elevator, but it didn't fall down. You've probably seen disaster movies where, you know, the elevator gets cut and it sort of races down to the bottom. Well, that never happens. And the reason it doesn't happen is because of the mechanism that you see here. Um, and the way it works is that there is a rope that comes down, a steel cable nowadays, that holds the elevator. And that pulls a spring together. And if the rope gets snapped, there is no pull anymore. So the spring extends. That's the bent thing you see underneath there that just extends. And uh, in this elevator, it pulls on two arms and that extends two hooks out to the side. And then um, they basically stop the elevator uh, because they hook into the jagged edges that you see on the side there. And so when the rope was cut, the elevator fell a little distance, something like that, and then it just stopped and was standing there. And that's what happens if the cable breaks in a modern elevator. The mechanisms used today are different. They use hydraulics and a dampening system so that it, it doesn't abruptly stop. But the principles are the same. And uh, Otis, um, he uh, was the first to come up with an elevator like that. And it was very, very popular because if you want to build high buildings, if you want to have a city and start to build skyscrapers, you need elevators. If you don't have safety elevators, you can't build high. Nobody wants to walk more than six stories up. And um, as a result, we got to build skyscrapers. And because we could build skyscrapers, we could have mega cities and we could have uh, company headquarters where lots of people could cluster together and work um, in a single location. And uh, it has been argued that two technologies, telephones and, um, and elevators, formed the modern company. Fast forward for about 150 years, and you're looking at um, the end of the 70s. Otis is an elevator company, just like any other elevator company. And uh, they are the biggest in the world, and they sell, they have a headquarter, and they sell um, elevators, and they have customers. Now, how do they make money? Well, the elevator industry is basically, it uses a business model that is sometimes called the Gillette model. And uh, Gillette is a company that makes racers. Here you have one. And if you want to buy a Gillette racer, um, you will find that you can buy one not so expensively. Um, and with the racer are these uh, blades. Um, and these blades, you use them for a few times, then they get dull, so you have to change them. And with the racer, which you can buy cheaply, comes a couple of blades. Then, when you want to buy more blades, you will find that these blades are very, very expensive. So basically, give away the racer and make money on the blades. Now, the equivalent of that in the elevator industry is that you sell um, an elevator when the building is built. Because once you put an elevator into a building, you're not going to haul it out again. That is a major expense. And if you go into old office buildings, you can find elevators that are 100 years old and still working. 
The reason they're working is because they are maintained. And the way Otis and every other elevator company in the world makes money is by having a service contract. And, and that's where they make their money. So, okay, how do they do it? Well, they have a regional organization like this. And um, then, you know, if you're a customer and there's a problem with your elevator, you call the local branch and um, the elevator repairman comes along. Let's call him Fred. Okay, here's Fred. And something else happens to your elevator. You call and Fred comes out and he fixes it. Sometimes Fred shows up, even if you haven't called. Um, and, uh, um, well, maybe he's doing uh, maintenance or something like that. So Fred basically keeps your elevators running. And it's very, very important to keep elevators running. You need to have a service contract because if the elevator stops working, you're not going to say, okay, we can just use the stairs. You need to keep the elevators running. All right. Now, imagine that this situation is going on. You have a fairly expensive service contract with Otis. And then one day, Fred shows up at your office um, and he says, Dear Mr. Customer, um, I am... Um, I'm thinking of starting my own business, and I know your contract is up for renewal, and I am going to offer you a contract, not with Otis, but with Fred's Elevator Maintenance, a small company. And it's going to be the same person, me or my people, fixing your elevators. We know how to do it. We've been doing it for years. But because we're a small organization, we have lower costs. So we are going to offer you a 40% discount on your service contract. How does that sound? Well, if you're a customer, that sounds pretty good, right? Okay, it's a smaller company, but you know them. They've been servicing your, uh, your things for years. Um, well, let's go with them. Now, now Otis has a problem because it still says Otis on the elevator. And if Fred is doing a bad job, well, who gets the blame? So what should Otis do in this situation? Because they can't just compete on price. They need to have a large organization. They need to develop new products. They need to sell elevators at a discount in order to get the fat service contracts. So what can they do? Well, here's what they did. First, they started a call center. They called this Otis line and they sold it to the customers based on the fact that you now had 24 hour service. All right, so you call the call center instead of calling the local branch. And the call center sends a message out to the local branch and Fred comes over and fixes your elevator. Now, how is this different? Well, the difference lies in data computers. This call center had access to a large computer and every time you called in they would note which elevator we were talking about, which customer, what the problem was, when it happened, all these things that you register uh, automatically and this goes into a big database. Now the wonderful thing about that is that now you can start to do statistics. If you have more than a million elevators installed uh, many of them will be the same kind, similar buildings. And you can start to see things like, if this elevator is used a lot, this part tends to break. Maybe we can change the part before it breaks, because we now have statistics and we know it. Perhaps we can compete by having the best data and providing the best elevator experience, rather than selling an elevator and just maintaining it. So, the next innovation that came from Otis was this thing. And this thing is called an REM box. And REM is not the band. It is remote elevator monitoring. And you notice there is a telephone there. You put that into an elevator and you offer something for the people who are using the elevator. You can lift that um, telephone and call and be in contact with the 24-7 call center immediately in case you get stuck in the elevator and you need help. But... This thing is not just a, a, a telephone, it is also a computer and it records data about the elevator. How many times the door is open and shut, okay? Uh, because that is a very good proxy for how much the elevator has been used. Whether there are frequent wait, um, uh, you know, people are 
putting too much weight into the elevator and that triggers an alarm, well, the computer will record that. All kinds of things um, that happens. If there's an error somewhere, um, then you know the computer will record that. And it, you know, the computer, this little thing, sits in the elevator and it communicates directly with Otis. In the beginning, it actually communicated over the telephone lines. You get uh, people would have sometimes have uh, telephone bills uh, that were high because the elevator was trying to call home and um, it, it took time. All right, so um, how about competing with Fred now? Well, if Fred shows up and he says, I would like to offer you a 40% cheaper contract, what could Otis do? Well, Otis could basically take their box and go. The REM box was Otis property. So if you had an elevator from Otis, you had the elevator, but you did not have the box. And the problem now for Fred is that, well, he maybe he could put his own box in, but Fred would have just a few elevators to monitor. Otis had lots of them and they got much, much better statistics. So they were much more precise in terms of what they could do with the elevator. Notice what's happened here. Otis used to have a problem. They were a big corporation with big costs and a business model that uh, relied on internal subsidies. And they were being outcompeted by people who did not have that overhead cost. Well, because they were using information to record what was going on with their products, they could turn their size into an advantage. The bigger you are, the more data you have. And they could outcompete the independent uh, service shops by offering a better experience because they have access to data. Nowadays, we call this predictive maintenance, and it is coming into a lot of industries, pr primarily industries that are asset rich, such as shipping, um, airline industry, um, property, oil production, all kinds of factories. Basically, you go from scheduling services on a you know, specific basis to closely monitor how something is being used and you start to sell a service rather than just a product. How did it go for Otis? Well, Otis basically said, uh, this is a quote from, uh, supposedly a quote from um, one of their um, annual reports. They say, elevators are only noticed when they break down. Our goal is not to be noticed. And that is the thing. You don't notice the elevator um, unless it breaks down. Just as a thought experiment, what brands of elevator do you know? Well, if you start thinking about it, if I mention them, you've probably seen them. So there are about 15 big companies in the world that produce elevators. Here are some of them. Otis, obviously. Schindler. Kony. Finnish company, ThyssenKrupp, German, Mitsubishi, Hitachi, and quite a few others. You've probably seen these labels when you go into an elevator, but do you actually remember what kind of elevators you have in the office where in the office block where you work? A lot of people don't. Or well, they think they have an Otis elevator or a Schindler elevator, and it turns out it's a Kony or a Mitsubishi. They just don't know. Okay. Now, Otis actually ran into a problem, which is their elevators were so reliable because of this predictive maintenance that the customers were talking about how expensive the service contract was because the elevators never break down. So what they had to do was use all this data they have to produce reports for their customers to show all the stuff they did in order to make sure that the elevators actually ran. Okay, but it kind of changes the business model quite dramatically. Okay, now that is interesting. This happened um, with Otis in 1979. Do we have more modern examples? Well, here is one company. The company is called Jotun. Jotun is a Norwegian company, um, but it is one of the biggest companies in the world in the business of uh, paint. And they have different business areas, uh, home paint, um, specialist paint for factories and things like that, certain kind of specific coatings. 
But a big part of their business is shipping, painting ships' hulls. Now this business, um, the competition is quite brutal. In paint, um, ships painting, you paint a ship about every fifth year. You take it up, you scrape the bottom for all the barnacles and all the stuff that's there, and then you treat it for rust, and then you paint it. A ship normally lives about 30 years, so you paint it, or 25 years, 30 years, so you paint it year five, year 10, year 15. I think after that, you have to start doing it every two and a half years. And at 25 years, the ship is decommissioned. That's sort of the normal way these things are done. I mean, if you're selling paint, you're selling it to wharfs who are going to paint, and they want a cheap, as cheap a price as possible. And Newton was trying to turn this into a high margin business, but it's kind of hard to do if you're just doing paint. Can you do the same business model at that Otis hand, selling a service for a product as simple as paint? Well, it turns out you can. And what Newton did was uh, basically change their business from selling paint to selling hull management. Um, and they set up a new division called Jutun Hull Performance. And um, basically what you, what you do is a ship runs through water. And when the ship is new, the paint is very slippery and, and the hull is free of growth and barnacles and rust. And the ship glides through the water very nicely. As the ships, you know, as the years go by, there are more and more growth and barnacles put on. And the ship does not glide so nicely through the water, and you use more fuel. Now, what Jutun did was basically to say, we are going to sell um, drag management. When a ship, when a, when a hull moves through water, um, and, and you know, the it, drag is the resistance that you have from the hull when it's pushed through. And what they are saying is, we are going to write a contract with our customers rather than selling them paint and claim that our paint is better, which is very hard to measure. We are going to sell them a contract that says that um, we guarantee that the increase in fuel consumption is going to be below a certain level if you paint the bottom of your ship with our paint. And the paint they have is very expensive. It's actually twice as expensive as normal paint. It's a whole process for uh, fixing the bottom of the ship. Now think about what you need in order to be able to do something like that. First of all, you need information. Just how do you measure how much you know a ship is resisting going through um, um, going through the water? And uh, Yulton had a long and interesting. Um, development project together with other paint manufacturers in order to derive a way to measure that. And they got it into an ISO standard so that they could write contracts over it. When something is a standard, you can write a contract guaranteeing that um, the performance is going to be below a, above a certain level. Well, and here's the result, or at least this is what Jutun sells. They say that if you paint with our paint, which is expensive, twice as expensive, um, you will experience 1.5% better performance. That is, you know, less fuel use. And also, all shipping, all, all hulls, all ships acquire growth over the years and they glide slower through the water. But we will we guarantee you that you will um, not experience an increase in fuel consumption uh, of more than four and a half percent in five years. Whereas the average, if you just paint with standard paint, is 18 percent more fuel um, at the end of the five year period. And that difference between four and a half and 18 percent, that turns out to be a very, very good investment. Now, this in order to sell this. You had to change the whole organization of Jutun. Instead of having people who sold cheap paint to people who were going to paint, to painters, wharfs, they had to get salespeople who could talk to the owners of the ship and sell them on an investment case. They also needed a way to capture the data, and they needed data scientists who could do the analysis. And they needed to use advanced, you know, much more advanced contracts, longer contracts and a service organization in place in order to make sure that this actually happened. 
it has been extremely successful. Uh, before they came up with this, one third of their sales was the expensive paint and two thirds of their sales was cheap paint where they were competing on price with others. Now it's the other way around. Also, Jotun was the first company to offer this as a service. The other paint companies are coming after, but Jotun has gotten better data, they have much more experience, and they have increased their market share so that they're now the biggest company in this business rather than the third biggest company, which they used to be some years ago. So you can, as you see, if you can get the data, you can um, turn your business from selling products to selling a service, and Pitch what you're doing as an investment rather than, um, uh, you know, being the cheapest on price. So, and this case is from 2019. Um, it's very, very new. But if you think about it, it is not substantially different from what um, Otis did in uh, the 1970s, the late 1970s. All right, so... Why are we talking about this? Well, there are lots of uh, new things coming up um, in this area. This is happening in a lot of industries. Um, one of the concepts that people are talking about is the concept of a digital twin. In order to be able to sell ship's paint, Jotun has to know, they have to have a model of how a hull glides through water, and they need to have a version of that model for every ship they contracted with. So basically, they need to have a digital hull that they can, uh, you know, get measures from the real ship and put it into their digital model and monitor how the ship is doing. Well, that model is now moving into all kinds of, of ships. DNVGL is a company that does certification of ships. And um, they used to have a model where they would have inspectors who would go onto the ship and inspect things. Well, with satellite communication, Lots of data storage, lots of sensors. You know, you can stick a sensor on a propeller axle. The propeller axle is vibrating. If you have the vibration data from the ship was new, you can, and you get data, you know, very rapidly, so you can sort of monitor it almost in real time. You actually need to go down and inspect that propeller axle to see if it's developing a vibration. You would know if you have a sensor there. That changes the business from having a network of people going in to um, inspect to having big databases and the best knowledge about how to handle that data and how to manage the asset on behalf of your customer. And this is happening in more and more industries and with more and more, um, uh, uh, more and more technologies. Here's another example from the same company. Here is an example from um, Hitech. Um, and, and this kind of shows the evolution. The company Dassault um, is a French company. Uh, it's a the Dassault system started as uh, the IT arm of um, uh, the Dassault airplane company. It's a French company that produced fighter jets and other things. They started to develop software um, to do construction. And then that was spun off as a business, and it is now the foremost company within CAD CAM in the world. But gradually, um, as you know, the technology has evolved, uh, it has gone from being, I can show you a single component and turn it around, to I can put all the components into a design and turn it around. The Boeing 777 aircraft was the first aircraft in the world where the prototypes were digital. So, you know, normally when you build an aircraft, you build a prototype, a mock airplane. And you do that so you can stand around it and talk about it and see that, you know, because we have got to have a shared picture when you develop something so that people can see that, you know, if I move my thing up there, then that interferes with something over here. And the way you do that is to build prototypes. Uh, with the 777, the Boeing 777, that was the first company where you had digital prototypes. Everybody was looking at the same uh, plane, but on a screen, and you could share the design. And they moved from that to being able to test the design. You can stress test it. You can simulate on a digital design. And uh, with the 777 was the first airplane where the first physical prototype actually flew. Because normally when you build an airplane before that, you would build a prototype, you would stand around, you would fix it and so on and so forth. Then you will build a new and better prototype. 
and you would repeat the process. And when you build the third prototype, that's the one you tried to test fly um, for the first time. With the 777, the two first ones were digital, much cheaper and turns out much better um, because you can experiment more. It's much cheaper to experiment. And the third one, when they built that prototype, it actually flew. And from then on, we have moved on from using you know, um, computers in construction to using computers in testing to using computers in what is called product life cycle management. So when you buy an airplane, it comes with a digital twin, a digital copy of the airplane. And anything you do to the airplane is reflected in the digital twin. And you have companies like uh, the people who produce the engines who will sell you an engine, but what you're contracting for is a certain performance, just like Hilton did. And from there on, we're moving on to when we have this digital twin, can we make it into a, an online um, experience for the customer? If you have a digital twin of a building, there is an example of a new hospital here in Norway a couple of years ago. And uh, when you move the uh, people, uh, the, the, when you have a new hospital and you need to receive your first ambulance, it's very important that the people who are going to receive that ambulance are familiar with the building because things need to happen fast. Well, what they did was they didn't have the building finished, but they did have a digital version of the building. And they could put on these HoloLens glasses. So all the people who were going to work in the building and receive ambulances, they could put on these glasses before the building was, was built. And they could simulate getting an ambulance in and understand, okay, I need to run down here. I need to go into the third door in here. That's where the operating table is and so on and so forth. Okay, so they could, they could train people in using the building before the building was built. Okay, and now you see what's going on. You know, the technology gets better and better. You can capture more and more data about the real world, and you can use that data for more and more lifelike experiences, both to manage the property in itself, but also to give a better experience to people who are going to use it. And it all started with Otis and the elevators and the problem of competing against low-cost competitors. Now, how do we put this into theory? Well, there are lots of theories you can use here, but you know, how can you make a technology like this a competitive advantage? The framework you see here, you've probably seen before, it's called a resource-based view of strategy. And it's kind of a little acid test on how you can manage something as a competitive advantage. Now, what you have to ask yourself is if you have a resource like the ability to do performance management, all the data that you have, for instance, your ability to do certain things. First of all, you have to ask yourself, is it valuable? Or is it, you know, if it isn't valuable, then it's a competitive disadvantage. You probably should get rid of it if you can. Secondly, you have to ask yourself, is it unique? If you're the only company with this resource, with the data, for instance, Okay, then, you know, uh, it might be um, a, a competitive advantage. But what we see very often, spe especially in, in information technology, is that somebody develops a way of doing things and then others copy it. All right, if that happens, you know, you're looking at something that, you know, is competitive parity. You know, having a certain computer system, for instance, an ERM system in order to manage your factory, that's no longer a competitive advantage. It doesn't mean you should stop doing it. You need to do it because everybody else is, but it, it's not giving you a competitive advantage. It's competitive parity. Okay, and then you have to ask yourself, is it hard to copy? If you do something um, and it takes the competition a lot of time to copy it, you know, the very nature of it, might be something that people can't get access to. Well, there are you know certain physical assets. If you're going to produce gold and you own a gold mine, well, you have a competitive advantage because you have access to gold. Um, but you know, in most instances, it's not as simple as that. Can data be a competitive advantage? Well, it can be if it's hard to get hold of. If you look at a company like Google. Google has a tremendous competitive advantage when it comes to search because they are so big and they have so much data about what people do and they've had that data for a long time. So they have a very sophisticated way of analyzing what you do. 
And that is very hard for a competitor to copy because, you know, you just can't get that data. You get less data and that's a problem, like Otis did, okay? But if it isn't hard to copy, then you're talking about something called a temporary competitive advantage. And temporary competitive advantages are great because they give you competitive advantage and it's only for a certain time. But, you know, you can milk it for as much as you can get out of it during that time. And as you see, it goes towards the end. Well, uh, maybe you can, uh, you know, sell it while it's still a competitive advantage. Maybe you can say, okay, I've had a competitive advantage here. I have six or seven competitors uh, and they are all starting to develop the same thing. If one or two of them starts developing it, there will be three or four other competitors who don't have it. Well, maybe I can spin it out as a separate business and I can sell it to that competition instead. This, is, this has happened in a number of industries, such as, for instance, in computerized reservation systems or in cloud computing and things like that. So, you know, a temporary competitive advantage is wonderful, but you have to manage it and understand that it is just that, a temporary competitive advantage. You see this in the pharma industry. Somebody comes up with a new drug. You have a patent, you know, um, protection for that drug, but it only lasts a certain time. And as it goes towards the end, you have to start thinking about how to manage that transition. And then, of course, you have the holy grail, something that's valuable, unique, and hard to copy. And uh, that will give you a sustained competitive advantage. And that's certain assets. It can be data. It can be your ability to continuously innovate. Um, it's very hard to find what are sustained competitive advantages because technologies change, competition changes, you know, the world changes. And what used to be a competitive advantage might not always be it. But if you can find them, they're fantastic. However, what's very important as a manager is to look at what you have and ask yourself, is what I have here valuable? Is it unique? Is it hard to copy? Well, if you don't know, you better find out because that is going to determine how you're going to manage that. And with that, uh, we're finished with the Otis example, the Yulton example, the Dassault example. And um, we learned a little bit about competitive advantage and how data can be a competitive advantage and what you need to do in order to get hold of it. And with that, this video is over.